push on what they want to know about us. I think when most people think of human trafficking, what they should think of is profiting from the control and exploitation of others. In just the general issue of human trafficking in Mexico, what can be done, what is currently being done. Human trafficking is universally made illegal and it's universally condemned by governments and, and actors all around the world, yet it's still happening. The way that it's happening is it's happening because it's, it's falling in between the cracks. It's happening in certain places where you wouldn't realize. Trafficking is a very dynamic crime. It's shape-shifting, it's, it's, it's morphing all the time. It's constantly being reactive to market opportunities and market demand. I think that's how it's learned how to persist and how it's learned to survive even being made illegal. This particular staffer I have not met yet. No, uh, but, I know it's hard to talk about, but if it helps you talk about it, you can also... In late 2007, we began operating the National Human Trafficking Hotline for the United States. First thing we wanted that was incredibly important to us was needs to be available 24-7. We can't just say, hey, we answer these calls from 9 to 5. The other thing that we thought was need to be multimodal. We don't want to just take phone calls. We want to take SMS texts and emails and web forms. We want to give people any way to, to any channel to get to us. And we wanted to have a live answer. You call in and you get a live person on the phone really quickly. The thinking behind it was, what did it take to get out of slavery in historical times? Maybe it took the Underground Railroad and walking late at night and staying at different houses. But now, in the 21st century, we all have cell phones. A lot of people in slavery actually have cell phones. So I think it's much more easy to get connected to help and connected to Google Maps or a GPS view from a satellite of where you are. All those things are present. So how do we leverage those tools and put it to use getting people out of slavery and getting people connected to services so they could work on rebuilding their lives. Five, so our initial urge to run the national hotline was giving survivors a lifeline and connecting survivors to services so that people can get out of these situations and use their cell phones to do so. But very quickly we realized the hotline operates on multiple levels. It's not just a get victims out of slavery, connect victims to services play. But on top of that, it's a giant source of data because coming into those calls are people saying, let me tell you all the inner workings of how this outlaw motorcycle gang is enslaving people. Or let me tell you all the inner workings of how this residential brothel operates. And then you begin to realize, wow, we're sitting on this perch where so much data and intelligence is flowing through this hotline while we're helping get people out of slavery. And then we began to realize that data can inform understanding the criminal networks. That understanding can inform a typology and categorizing all the different types of trafficking. And that can ultimately inform these end state fights and campaigns and interventions to go after trafficking type by type, country by country around the world and get to that final question that we're working towards, which is how do you eradicate it? And now we see this linkage between hotlines, getting people out of slavery and serving victims, as well as data, as well as campaigns. And I think there's something really powerful going on between that combo of those three things.